So these are the five um, clans, um, and I'm going to introduce you to them more specifically now. Uh, the Marsh Pride, probably the dominant force in Savuti. Um, very interesting pride. They, uh, there were ten of them. Um, three of them were adult lionesses, and the rest of them were quite young cubs of, of different ages. So it always made for quite a, a lot of entertainment. They were fun to film, fun to be with. Um, they were always up to no good, stealing bags from cars and doing um, strange little things. They were quite happy-go-lucky. They ruled by brawn and power and owned the jewel of the whole area, the, the Great Marsh. Um, they were led by a they were led by a lioness called Matsumi. Um, Matsumi, Ma, a lot of my um, Botswana people would know. Um, Ma being mother and Suma being hunter and hunter. So she was mother hunter and that is something she certainly was. Um, I remember when I first did a recce into Savuti um, in 2008 as the water was coming in there for the first time after 30 years um, and I saw Matsumi as a cub. She was about three... Uh, weeks old, really small. Um, she was a litter of, part of a litter of four, and her brothers and sisters were all sort of lying in a big heap, you know, bellies up. They were farting, making a noise. And Matsumi was off to one side, and she was actually, you know, chasing a butterfly or trying to kill her mother's tail, even at such a young age. I mean, she was destined to be a great lion. She was destined to be a leader. And she kind of led this pride. Um, right through the Savage Kingdom uh, period. Um, an amazing individual. Um, but the Marsh Pride had one advantage over the other lions in the area, their competitors. They had that guy. Um, now that is Sekakama, and he was the dominant male. Um, he was dominant out of a coalition of two, um, but he was the dominant male. The brute force, he was the muscle um, that sort of ruled over that entire, entire area. And I didn't make up his name at all. His name is Sekikama, you know, not Sekikama, Sekikama. <laughs> um, not after our president, but um, he was the ruler of that entire, of that entire area. Um, and he kind of enabled them to hold on to uh, the jewel, the, the Great Marsh. Um, let's meet uh, the Marsh Pride. Matsumi's young have a direct line to the throne. She must make them warriors. She is scarred mother and commander. shows promise. She has gifts your sons do not. She will be your heir. to leading than just killing. Matsumi, the provider, must hold this volatile gang together and appease her brutal king. Sekakama. No 
nobody eats before him. Least of all, his sons. Even Matsumi yields. So, for those of you that end up watching this, you'll always realize that in the Savage Kingdom, the piggy always gets it. Um, just to introduce you to the, the next group of lions, um, the Northern Pride. Um, they were a group of lions that lived in the forests and the hills that sort of overlooked the Great Marsh. And the two prides were very uh, similar in many ways. They, um, instead of 10, these guys were nine. Um, and it was led by a lioness called uh, Satao. Um, and she kind of steered where this pride went. And her, she, was, she was one of two lionesses, and the other was her mother. So it was quite a close family. The rest of that pride were cubs. Um, but unlike the uh, marsh pride, they were all of the same age, and they were already about three years old. Um, they didn't have an adult male, um, and that was the defining difference between the two, the two prides. In fact, Sekikama was actually their father, was part of their group. And once he'd had those cubs, he kind of just abandoned them and headed down to the south, to the, to the, the glory land, and joined Mitsumi and her pride in the south. Um, and although they were young, you could see they were starting to get quite big, and seven, uh, six out of the seven of those cubs were actually young males. So they started to pose a real threat to Sekikama's reign. And that pride um, really wanted to move down into the, into the marsh and, and, and take it for themselves. And you can start to see how the Game of Thrones narrative starts to, starts to push in. Um, let's, uh, let's, meet the mar let's meet the Northern Pride. Satao knows the dangers of buffalo. Her six young sons and daughter do not. But this is the moment they have been training for. Take this beast down. Skillful defense by the old bull. Satao has yet to teach her young family how to kill in water. They will learn. They, they were a very um, interesting pride and very quickly um, fell under the wrath of Sekikama and the entire dynamic of that pride shifted um, very quickly. Um, from the sort of brawn and muscle of the lion world around uh, Savuti, um, we moved to a very different type of character. Um, 
and possibly my my favorite um, uh, Saba um, she is a mother leopard whose territory was right at the heart of where all of these uh, predators were being thrust um, I had the dubious privilege of being in charge of finding Saba. And working with the leopard is totally different to working with the lion. Um, you track a rugby team through the bush or you track a, a secret silent assassin. Um, it's a lot harder to keep up with her. But the positive side of it is that instead of dealing with a team, you're dealing with an individual. And um, I got to know Saba incredibly well. Um, I had spent several years with her. I did a film on part of her life um, and um, it really was a privilege to spend another chunk of time really focused on that individual. Um, it's a very personal relationship. Uh, it's very one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's very uh, hard to stay impartial and, and, and you know, remember that you're dealing with a whole bunch of, uh, of different families. Um, we all had our favorites. Rich loved the Marsh Pride and the fun of the Marsh Pride. I, I loved this cat. I loved Saba. Um, she used to come right up to the truck, as I explained before, just lie down and sleep next to you. In fact, one night I used to, uh, I was downloading material that I shot of her sitting at night in the dark in front of my computer, and I was downloading material, and, you know, I'd feel this, you know, something on my foot, and I think like a beetle had flown into my computer by the lights and fallen down into my shoe and I kind of shook it out and carried on and, and it carried on. So then I looked down and I leant down to get it out of my shoe and it was actually Saba uh, smelling my shoe and her whiskers were tickling the side of my foot. You know? um, and it's those kind of scenarios that really uh, endeared me to her. Um, I never felt that I was in danger. I never felt that I was threatened in any way by her. Um, and um, you know, if I had the thing all over again and I had an animal that I would go to, um, it would have been her. Uh, let's meet Saba. <laughs> There is one that rises above them all. Saba, the phantom assassin, watches everything. Living alone, hunting alone. Stealth is her greatest weapon. She can kill almost anything, but birds are her speciality. She is perfect, but for a small nick to her ear. Um, remember I said how some particular individuals develop a, their own unique set of skills, um, and that's what kept me interested in these animals. Um, Saba was an example of that. Um, I used to follow her all around Savuti, and uh, she would go up to a tree, and there's a big uh, nest in the top of the tree, and she normally went to nests that were from the bigger birds, uh, eagles or owls or uh, various things. In this case, um, a... Uh, 
a barn owl nest. And she would go up and she'd get to the nest and look inside and there were often eggs or small chicks in there and I'd be waiting for her to just dive in and, and, and kill them and eat them. And very often she actually just used to ignore them and then she'd bounce back down the tree and she'd move on. And I was like, well, you know, um, you know eat while you can. And then two weeks later, um, she would try uh, and kill an impala and she would miss, and she would try and kill um, a diker, and she would miss, and she'd be failing and failing and failing, and um, then she would remember where that nest was, and she'd do an about turn, and she would march and do a beeline straight to where that was. She had mapped out a pantry right across Savuti. She knew where she had these little emergency rations that she should go, could go and access at any time, and this is one of them. We had been with her at this tree two weeks before this happened. Um, Janet and Ashley, who were with us in Botswana, witnessed her climbing up and eating her little emergency ration. Um, and, you know, that sort of uh, mapping out, I mean, just shows the level of intelligence that they have. Um, and it served her incredibly well. She had two cubs, and when her back was against the wall and she needed food to, to, to uh, help get the milk flowing, um, she could always turn back to, to, to finding uh, uh, something small to eat. Um, she just was, you know, cut above the rest, and she had this air about her of a sort of sense of royalty. I mean, she's an exceptional, exceptional cat. Um, another one of my favorite animals and the families that were there were wild dogs. Now, as, as long as I can remember, um, in Savuti, uh, no pack of wild dogs actually denned in that area. They make uh, dens underground, and obviously the pups are incredibly vulnerable, so no pack of wild dog actually denned in Savuti because there were too many predators, there was too much activity. And the year that we started Savage Kingdom, uh, this small pack of dogs came out of nowhere, and they were just determined to stay and live in Savuti. This was now their home, and they were going to you know, have a go at it, they were here to stay. Um, and it was a great family to, for, to follow. Um, they were, there were only six dogs in the pack, which is particularly small for a wild dog pack anyway. Um, they were outgunned, outnumbered. Um, they were the real underdogs, the sort of refugees, as you were, um, of Savuti. And they really were tenacious and wanted to really make a go of it. Um, let's meet the, the pack. The Pale Pack is new to the kingdom. Runaways from a barren wasteland. Two formidable hunters lead the pack. The devoted Timana, wearing her distinctive white diamonds, and the heroic Malau, with his golden collar. These six dogs, a splinter group from a larger clan, desperately need to increase their ranks. If their pack gets any smaller, they will never survive. They're here to defy the odds. With great leaders like Timana and Malau, a small pack can grow quickly. But they need to kill every day. Endurance. 
Use what we have. Run them into the ground. So leopards um, were difficult to work with because they're sneaky and hard to find. Uh, dogs were definitely the next um, hardest character to keep up with. Um, they're incredibly fast, and as soon as the hunt kicks off, if you want to be part of that, you've got to be driving through the bush at 35 kilometers an hour, um, just trying to keep up with them. Um, and you don't know who you're going to stick with and, and who you're going to move with. And they are basically a one-on-one a one -on -one, a one -on -one lesson on how to completely wreck a filming truck. Um, we we kept up with them um, the best we could. Um, and uh, we knew that they were denning in Savuti. Um, we just didn't know where. Um, and we had tried tracking them, but we couldn't, uh, we couldn't consistently pick up a direction that they were going in. And we knew that uh, we had to find the den. And the only way we were going to find that den is to get them on a kill. Um, they would woof it down. Uh, now that there's five of them, the Tiamana was staying at the den to babysit and look after her pups. And they would woof her down and they'd have to run back to the den to feed her. Um, and they had to do that fairly quickly, otherwise sort of digestion would start setting in and they wouldn't, would, would not be able to regurgitate for her. So the one day, the pack killed a pig. Piggy always gets it. Uh, they killed a pig out on the open marsh. And um, I knew that this was our moment to... Two. There were only five of them, and this was the moment that we were going to find the den. So I called in a few other vehicles, and we were hell-bent in making it to the den this time. Um, typically, uh, they went off the edge of the marsh, straight into the thick stuff, and then they just started running, you know, 25 k's an hour right through the middle of the Mapani, this really hard, scrubby environment. And... Um, I went in after them and we had another vehicle sitting on the edge of the marsh, you know, just sort of mirroring where our movements are and we kept in touch. And, you know, I, you know, I could just hear the bush raking out the wires, the pipes and everything underneath our car. I mean, brakes were starting to fail and we just had to do it. We were just smashing, smashing through the bush. And at one point we actually, I actually ended up jamming the car in between two trees. We got stuck in between two trees and I had to call the other vehicle to cut ahead and cut into the bush and pick them up and keep on them while I got myself out of the bush and try to catch up again. Um, and we followed them for about 25 minutes um, before we finally lost the pack. Um, still running on adrenaline, you know, panicking that we'd lost them. We got out and we got on the ground and started tracking and went through this clearing and walked straight into the den. Um, right in front of us, and so we, we made it all the way. Um, and finding that den was such a uh, a great uh, moment for us. It was one of the big turning points for us within the dog story itself. Um, Timana was living there. She had uh, six pups, um, and we got a really amazing little window into the life of these little dogs growing up and, and, and living in this thing. Um, they were not that far from the edge of the marsh. They were right under our nose all the time, but they had managed to conceal that den so beautifully. Um, it just took us forever and the wrecking of one of our cars to just actually find, find the den. Um, last but not least, um, hyenas. Everybody sort of disregards hyenas. They, they, they have bad association with them. They're one of my favorite of, of all the animals. They, um, Incredibly successful. I mean, few people realize that the hyena is actually the most successful predator that we have in Africa. Um, they really are ahead of most of the others. Um, one, of the, one of the things that um, worried us is that when we first arrived in Savuti, um, we saw probably three hyenas uh, in the first year. Um, and as time went on, slowly but surely, we started seeing a few more and a few more, and um, they started coming out of the woodwork and getting a bit more relaxed around us. But by the time we started Savage Kingdom, um, these guys had already built a small army. Um, again, we knew that the den was there, and it was just a case of 
finding a female who's lactating and just doing the hike and doing the time and following her all the way back up uh, towards the sand ridge. They always denned, uh, we found out once we found the den, that, that a lot of the dens were on the edge of the sand ridge. Um, let's meet these guys. A battle-hardened clan of mothers. The sisterhood is raising an army. Growing their numbers is the only hope against lions. Lose, and a generation will starve. Armies need discipline. Zalika's rule is absolute. Hyenas are really fascinating to me. Um, the entire social structure is governed by aggression. Um, they um, it's a matriarchal society, and because of that aggression in their societies, um, a lot of the uh, females have such high levels of testosterone in their, in their bodies all the time. And over years, they've developed these pseudopenises, so they're quite odd in, in a lot of ways. But um, that level of aggression um, actually manifests in the womb, and you actually get... Um, two siblings fighting it out in the womb. And the level of testosterone in a fetus inside the womb is often much higher than an adult male hyena. Um, so they're very peculiar animals in a whole, uh, um, in, in, for a lot of ways. And what, what I really liked about them in this particular show is that their path was kind of the antithesis of all the others. While everybody else was fighting to survive, these guys were getting fat on all the killing and everything that was happening during that time. So they kind of countered the whole, um, the whole Savage Kingdom kind of uh, uh, program. Um, so those are the, the five animals that uh, we really um, invested a lot of time in, invested a, a, a lot of emotion into. We had the crews around the clock working with them for 15 months. And as we got to understand their plight, their different lives, their different directions, um, that in itself started to become a bit of a problem for us in that we knew at some point these clans were going to clash. And when they did, you know, whose side were you going to be on? Did you inadvertently um, try and support your favorite? Um, or were you going to be able to just stand back and know that this is the process and this is what was happening? Um, we often had these debates. You know, Richard and I used to have arguments over the radio saying, well, keep your lions away from my guys. I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, it's not going to be fair. You know, you've got lions. And, um, one of the... Uh, two of the main characters that I uh, felt were the, sort of the lead heroines of the entire place, the ones that I got to know uh, the most, was Mitsumi um, and Saba. Uh, Mitsumi I'd known since she was a cub. Uh, I'd seen her become this warrior cat um, who took on the biggest of prey. Um, and Saba, who, um, you know, you could see why I loved that cat. Um, there was one uh, particular incident in this whole uh, project that really brought home what this entire project was about for me. Um, Basically, Saba used to leave her cubs. She had two cubs, uh, a male and a female. And she used to leave them on this big hill called Leopard Rock um, the, that formed a sort of nursery for her. And she was out hunting. And um, of the two, the daughter was much bolder and more adventurous and probably a little bit impatient. And what she did was lead her brother down off the side of Leopard Rock 
Um, and this is... Matsumi, the huntress of the marsh pride, is looking for a den of her own. She heads towards Saba's stronghold. Saba is finally home. But her calls go unanswered. Find them. Saba finds her cubs. But it's too late. So, uh, as you can imagine, um, this, this particular event really shook me. Um, it was really unfortunate that the two uh, females that I love most in this, uh, in this program came together in such a um, devastating way. Um, it was one of the hardest things that I had to witness, let alone uh, film. Um, and, um, <clears throat> but it was, it made me realize it was not uh, for me to judge. I couldn't be, I couldn't hate Mitsumi um, for what she had done. I, I couldn't uh, be angry with Saba. You know, this was the natural process of survival playing out. Um, and you had to just accept that. Um, Saba took her cub, she took it up to the tree and tried to revive it by licking it. Um, it, was, it was dead already. Um, and eventually she ate it, um, returning it back to the body from where it came. Um, I got sort of completely thrown out by this and I, I actually had to leave Savuti. Um, I went home, I needed to get some space, gather my thoughts um, and um, just step away from it um, and contextualize what had happened. And this is the kind of thing that happens when Africa's 
Apex predators get squashed into a small environment and then have all of their resources withdrawn. Um, it becomes brutal, you know, it becomes savage. I mean, it is, uh, it's quite epic. Um, the first season, the first installment of Savage Kingdom uh, hits our screens this next week. Um, and uh, since then, um, there have been a number of births. Um, the Marsh Pride, Mitsumi and her sister have both had cubs. Um, uh, so, uh, Satao, she, you know, her pride was decimated. Uh, they have another 10 cubs who are already a year old. Um, there are a lot of new lives fighting their way in Savuti and, and making their new path. Um, the dogs have had new pups, and Saba's son, who survived, um, is growing strong, learning very quickly. He's um, actually slightly bigger than his mother already. Um, as for my own family, my children are trying very hard to be teenagers. Um, but I hope that... <laughs> I hope that um, <clears throat> their early years in the bush, they, it has sort of instilled a sense of the environment and, and nature in them, that they can sort of grow up uh, loving the animals and, you know, working to protect the animals. Um, and, uh, you know, continue what we try to do um, going forward. Um, I believe that as humans, we are becoming less and less uh, in touch with nature. We're being separated further and, further and further away. Behind our cement walls and neon lights, some people only get to see some of these animals in sanitized nature films or cartoons um, or in a zoo. Uh, some people are fortunate enough, fortunate enough to come and visit us in Botswana and go on a safari and see these animals for themselves. Um, what we try to do with the films that we make is try and take people out of their offices, out of their homes, and in some ways out of their own heads, and to try and get them to uh, get involved in a little moment in time where they can emotionally relate to these animals. Um, and um, let that sort of uh, reach out and sort of touch them and motivate them to, to really care about these animals. We want people to feel the, uh, the thrill, to see the beauty, um, accept the, the, the savagery of it, the brutality of it, and just really um, wake emotionally to, to the wonderful um, creatures that we live with and associate to them the way we do uh, while out in the field. Um, in Botswana. Um, we have fun. Uh, we do what we do because we love it and because we love those animals. Um, and it gives us much joy and much pride. Um, so thank you. Thank you.